This episode of The Candid Frame is sponsored by the Charcoal Book Club. Working with the most respected names in contemporary photography, Charcoal selects and delivers essential photo books to a worldwide community of collectors. Each month, members receive a signed first edition monograph and an exclusive print to add to their collections. Join the club by visiting charcoalbookclub.com and use the promo code BECANDIDFRAME at checkout and receive a 10% discount on your first membership payment. My current position provides me a unique perspective. I experience firsthand what it takes to curate and put on a museum exhibition. Many resources, including people, time, and money, are needed for an idea to turn into an open show. The care and dedication involved are not to be undervalued or underestimated. Natasha Egan, the executive director at the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago, knows that very well. Over the past two decades, she has not only curated numerous exhibitions, but she has played an important role in establishing the museum as an important force in photography in the heart of the country. This conversation was enlightening and left me so excited to return to museums and galleries in the very near future to enjoy the work of the past and the present. This is Ibarian X, and welcome back to The Candid Frame. How are you? I'm good. I'm very good. Yeah. Well, it's a pleasure to talk to you. I'm glad that uh, your people reached out to me uh, as I learned more about you know, the institution there and thought, oh, this would be a really good conversation. I've, I've, so I've been looking forward to it. So l- let's start with you before we start about the, the work that you that you do there. When did you fall in love with the photography? What, what was that what was that triggering moment for you? You know, I have always loved photography. My father loved photography, so I grew up around it. He had a dark room in, in the bathroom, and so I always grew up around around photography. But I didn't know I was going to have like a career or my path was really in photography until after college. I had taken some photo classes like in, in high school and college, but nothing too serious. But after college, I thought, what am I going to do with my life? <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I had, you know, one asked that. Yes. So I had studied, um, yeah, I'd studied like Asian history and religion and had spent, uh, you know, some time studying in Asia, but I just didn't know what I was going to do with that. I didn't see myself becoming like a, you know, a, getting a PhD in Chinese history. I don't know. I'm a little bit too broad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I thought, oh, I love photography and I love to uh, teach and maybe I should bring those together. So I started studying photography and I met, I took a photo history class at the University of Washington with a photo curator. His name was Rod Slemons. He was the photo curator at the Seattle Art Museum. And he just, I just, he just opened my eyes and I just was like, wait a minute. Like, I want to become that guy. Uh, <laughs> I like love what he's talking about. I love what he does. And I became that guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that was a long time ago. Yeah. I just did a rep- um, presentation where I was talking about why those of us who are into photography love it so. For me, and I think a lot of people who I've spoken to, it's it's that connection between photography and the emotion that it brings up. Like for me, it's the moment of discovery in making the composition. That moment when I was 10 years old, when that happened to me, that created a, such a visual experience in me that I've always been in pursuit of it. And You know, so for me, it started off as I, I loved to travel. And I loved photographing while I was uh, while I was traveling, and you know, capturing kind of the the moments of the people I met. Um, I, I I loved that. Um, but what what really hit me the most uh, when I went to then start 
studying photography was less about me making a picture and but me being completely fascinated with the power of the image. And I'll give you I'll give you an example that of why I ended up in this field. And I had said earlier about this course I had taken about the history of photography with the curator Rod Slemons at the University of Washington. And he put up a picture, uh, a photograph of Ansel, an Ansel Adams photograph um, of the Sierra Nevadas with all these white boulders um, in front. And he said, you know, what, what are you looking at? You know, and I thought, okay, we all know Ansel Adams and they're really beautiful. And I, I studied them and I, I mean, he's, a, he's, a, he's an amazing photographer. But what the, what the professor said at that moment, which blew me away, was Ansel Adams is standing, is taking this picture of the Sierra Nevadas from a Japanese internment camp. And he is behind the fence looking out at what the Japanese see. And that moment for me sealed the deal on like that photography is so much more mm. <laughs> than what I had ever thought. And from there, it became this complex issues of the role of camera in colonialism and, and art and anyway, so from there that, but I'll never forget that sitting in that class that moment and being like, here I always thought that it was just about the beauty of the mountains when there was so much more and it's so complex and landscape and place are so complex. And for me, that is what has driven me for these last 27 years <laughs> from when I discovered, when I had that, that class. <laughs> that, that's a fascinating moment to have, you know, to think about the, 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 the photographs within the context of when they were created, because we we're all sort of inclined to just look at a photograph within, you know, face value because it is, just, you know, it is a visual medium, but to see the photograph and the experience of, of creating it and experiencing it as a viewer can be deeper, you know, that having that, having that context provides so much more to the, you know, the, to the, the enjoyment, the pleasure, the insight that you can get from taking a look at a photograph. I, I, I agree. I mean, and, and that's the, that's the complicated part. And of course, if you think about the role of image today, you know, we're bombarded with images, you know, you, you think about what you're seeing in, uh, you know, in the news, on social media, um, and you don't know most of the context. And this is the danger of it as well. I mean, it's, yeah. mm -hmm. it's both, it's both wonderful, but also this exploration of how, how intent changes so much. And, so the more you, the more you dig, um, and you can't always do it by just looking. Obviously, I could have looked at that Ansel Adams picture forever on a calendar. I mean, everyone has. <laughs> um, and I think most people would have no idea that that picture has anything to do uh, with the war, being, being um, an, an, an Ansel Adams role in uh, trying to work, be an advocate for the, for the, for the Japanese and get them, give them voice and freedom in many ways or to explore that. And that's something you just don't know when you're looking at a, a, a beautiful picture on a calendar. You know, you started working at the museum as a, as a graduate student. Yes. That's a completely different world. You know, when you go, when you work in an institution like that, because it's, people think, oh, it's a nice place where you can go see photographs, right? But <laughs> there's a lot, you know, there's, there's a collection that has to be preserved, that has sort of be quantified in terms of the information, uh, in terms of the photographer, what it was created, the methodology. But like you said, there's so much to be learned about the photographer, why and when the images were created. What were some of the surprises that you, that you sort of experienced during those, the, the, those early years of working with, with uh, at the institution that opened your eyes even more than they already were? Well, I would I would say so. I yeah, I have worked at this museum since 1995, and uh, every year I started off as a graduate student. Like, you know, I always say I worked my way up from the mailroom to <laughs> being the director of the museum, and uh, and I would say all of these years, it's it's an it's a it's a constant kind of eye-opening experience because when you're working with contemporary photography, you're working with contemporary issues that are happening in front of you as well as looking at the past and understanding the past in new ways. And what has what has kind of happened, you know, what I what I love is 
learning about the world through this great variety of artistic lenses. And the more the world has opened up because of social media and just globalization, the more you understand or the more you learn about how history has been documented and how it has to be kind of unpacked and how that how the camera has been used sometimes in harmful ways and sometimes in really beautiful ways to you know look at the to look at the world and and, and what's happening so i'm trying to think of some other like moments that I had that like blew me away. Um, like I, I know it's so funny that Ansel Adams one, like I just was like, what? <laughs> um, and, and it just gives me a whole new appreciation. Um, so I'm trying to think of if I had other ones that I was blown away that I can like recall being blown away with, but there, there, there are, there are many artists that I kind of fell in love with due to kind of like the, the complexity of the work that they were doing and what I was kind of learning from it. I'll give one example of an artist I worked closely with who I met in the early 2000s. Her name is Beata Gustau. She was living in Hamburg, Germany when I met her and now lives in in Berlin. And it was kind of still still slightly early days of Photoshop. And, you know, I was a little skeptical of Photoshop because it's like I felt like it was kind of gimmicky at first, um, yeah. but what I love is with every technology, you know, and, and with every technology that comes, I mean, we could talk about when color film came out, it was still looked at as only commercial photography and not embraced by the artist. And so it was the same thing with the Photoshop. It was like, until it's braced by contemporary conceptual artist, you know, it it's just more of like a playful tool. But then once, artists be, are able to use it in conceptual ways, uh, I was able to then be like, okay, this is the future. And Beata Gustav was an example of someone who used Photoshop so smartly <laughs> that, uh, that that was a new, that, that I mean, this was like, again, like in the early 2000s and it just like changed my opinion. So she has hundreds of pictures that are put together, but you would never know that. And so this idea of, creating a place that doesn't exist at all, that looks completely like reality, but is then in a way painted and, and created. She does these idyllic landscapes and then she does these totally, you know, you know, like, uh, what's the word, um, you know, dystopic landscapes. Yeah. And, and so the, and the, and the idyllic ones look like kind of, they're based on these, paintings from like the Renna, you know, not, not the Renna, from, you know, they're based on these sort of romantic paintings and the dystopic black and white ones are based on sort of 1950s black and white architecture, you know, where she really plays off of, and, and what happens when you look at these two bodies of work together, which are completely fabricated with like clouds from places and trees that have been, chopped because they're from a city but they're now like should be a beautiful tree <laughs> it is mm -hmm. um it's just when you create it, it makes you think about what our place is what we are what what is human what's the human impact on the world but what and what is what is nature and what and 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 so she was someone i really loved working with um years ago and have built up a relationship with where I showed a couple pieces in a show, then I did a solo show and a publication, and, and I really invested time uh, into that artist. Um, and I really loved, you know, in a way, discovering her or me. I mean, I was mm -hmm. I, I was introduced to her, but that was a, an example of where technology changes and how you really can use it as like a conceptual tool. The mu museum is is relatively young, having begun in the in the in the mid seventies. You know, it's it's located in the Midwest. What was the idea of creating, you know, such an institution, such a body at that time? And what can you tell us about, you know, the initial collection that was put together? Yeah, so what, one of the things that was happening in the early 70s and mid-70s across this country and, you know, also you, you see this in Europe as well, was this uh, desire to have photography, you know, stand out more on its own. So you had, 
you had places like the Art Institute of Chicago separate f photography had originally been in like prints and drawings department and they created like a photography department also in the mid 70s you see the museum of fine arts in houston hire ann tucker as one of their first photography curators in i don't know the exact date but i would, let's say it's like 1975 76 around that same time and so there was this there was this group of photography, I mean, you had photography in the museums before, uh, but it was a little, it was always not, not totally embraced in the same, in the same way. It was its own, uh, it's kind of this, their own department or with prints and drawings. And, and so, so I think what happened was I was not here when we formed the museum um, in 1976. However, there was a lot of dis discussion and we are an academic art museum and we have um, at we're part of Columbia College which has a wonderful photography department and a long history and so you have to also then look at when were schools starting to create photography programs and our museum started off as a photography gallery to support photographers who were going to be teaching and we would have, you know, an exhibition of their work uh, and then they could maybe teach some, you know, would teach classes at Columbia. And then what happened was that that was for in the 70s. And then in the late 70s, the chair of the photography department had band together with a group of, let's say, six passionate photography collectors um, here in Chicago. And they together said, you know, let's not just have this be a gallery where we hang the works on the walls and the students who are taking that class at that moment can work with that, those works, but why don't we start a collection and why don't we turn this gallery into a museum? And so it was in 1979 that we collected our very first photograph. It's a very funny picture to have be it the first picture, but it was the, this group of collectors kind of came together and started to purchase work for the museum and work with artists. And so our collection is now 16,500 works and we heavily collect out of our exhibitions. So it, it when you look at our collection, it almost has this wonderful history of who we were discovering along the way. Um, and it gives us that chance to collect works by artists before they're really known and recognized. And then, and because we consider ourselves like this, this platform for showcasing new emerging work or we, I mean, we show very famous artists as well here, but we, I would say we specialize in showing projects that haven't really been seen before because we're really willing to take the risk on the idea that these artists have. And we, we don't wait for them to be kind of vetted in the art market and someone else to tell us like, oh no, this is the, this is valuable. Like for us, it's valuable because of the content and we're a teaching institution. And it does this work, you know, push the dialogue, whatever the subject is. I mean, we currently have an exhibition about you know, gun violence in the United States, uh, but through, you know, very conceptual art. So it's not like looking at uh, a newspaper. Uh, it's looking at a more emotional, artistic rendition of how do you wrap your head around the amount of guns in the United States. Anyway. So. Well, no, that's, in that's an interesting, that's an interesting thing to know that that's one of the ways that you acquire photographs is through the, the, you know, the exhibitions that are curated and then exhibited on the walls of the, of the gallery there. You know, I think that it's sort of a mystery sometimes in terms of, you know, how do, how do the images end up in a collection? Are there's a, a secret cabal of, you know, of, of photographers that are out there scouring for all this valuable work and competing with each other to get it? Or, you know, so it's really kind of interesting to see that this is one of the many ways that, that images find their way into their into your collection. How do you, how have you seen in terms of the choices of what to include in collection change during the time that you've been there? Because we've always really focused on the um, emerging artist, we, we, we're, we're quite proud of what we have collected over all of these years. Um, and 
we're a little bit different than a lot of other, well, much larger museums that I think left a lot of people out. Now, of course, we have tons of people left out of our collection because we don't have the funds to collect all the people that are in the canon. Anyways, <laughs> so, <laughs> so we have kind of a different group of collection. But when we first started, to go back to your previous question, when we first started um, the collection, we actually had a much more narrower focus. Um, it, well, not that, it wasn't much narrower, but right now we're really, we collect uh, kind of internationally. But then we were focused on, because we had the Art Institute down the street and we, um, and we had the Museum of Contemporary Art, we had the History Museum here in Chicago, we had the Field Museum, we have all these museums that, that do have some photography in their collection. But the the Art Institute was more historical, and the MCA was conce you know conceptual photography in the, in their collection. And so we found this niche where we wanted to focus on American photography. From basically, um, we had picked the date of when uh, Robert Frank had photographed the Americans. Mm -hmm. So that was in 1956, and the publication date of the Americans was in the in the U.S. was 1957. So the founders of our museum, we have let go of this, but they said we collect photography by American artist or U.S. resident artist from 1957, and because they felt that Robert Frank's Americans, even though he was Swiss photographing in America, mm -hmm. was a turning point in the way the camera was used as a tool for um, how he studied America. We let that go probably, well, now it's probably been 20 years since we let that go because it was too hard to argue, like, what do you mean, Robert Frank? Like, let's talk about all the other people who did that before mm -hmm. Robert Frank. <laughs> and so we had uh, the director who let it go, ironically, um, you've heard me say his name before, my professor who was, at the, who was the curator at the Seattle Art Museum, who I, who I met at the University of Washington um, in 2001 became the director of this museum. Um, and it was, and so I worked with him. I was the associate director at the time uh, with, with him. I literally did become him. As I said in the beginning of this conversation, yeah. my goal was to become him and I absolutely did become him because he was the director and now I'm in, I, he retired and I, and now the director in his shoes, which is funny. So, and so anyway, so he changed that and we ended up, you know, because there was a lot of exhibitions that we were working on. We always had done international exhibitions, but we were con constrained to only collect the work of the American artists that we were working with, which we decided, why are we doing that? So, so, uh, so a big change for us about 20 years ago was to, to let go of that and really embrace what we're showing. And so I would say that a lot of what we um, have collected since then is more is, I mean, it's definitely American and, and, and we, and we like to also collect local, uh, but is a, is a more of an international group of artists. And I would say a lot of the work is dealing more with kind of human rights. Mm -hmm. We, we take pride in that, we have a very good record of showing women artists. We have a good record of showing um, artists of color. You know, if you look at our record, we we we're we're, we're proud of that <laughs> in our in our in our history. You know, you support a program called the Midwest uh, Photographers Project, which you know encourages the work of regional photographers. I'm really kind of curious to hear more about how you feel as a Midwest uh, institution. How that provides you if not sort of access, uh, a different perspective than is traditionally considered when it comes to, you know, the collection and exhibition of, of photographs. Because largely, you know, they've been, it's been heavily weighted towards, you know, you know, East Coast or European traditions. How does it uniquely manifest where you are? You know, I think it's very, very important for any place and particularly a city like Chicago, which it's no longer population-wise the second city, but as you know, we're called the second city. <laughs> and um, um, I think in, you have to, we have some fabulous um, institutions here. I mean, some of the most famous artists are coming out of, 
you know, the art, the, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, Columbia College, you know, um, University of Chicago, UIC, University of Illinois, Northwestern. I mean, the artists and the professors that are here, we have such a tremendous group of international thinkers in this global city. So I think it's very, very important to focus, have this Midwest Photographers Project and focus on the, the wealth of creativity that is in your home. And I think if you drain that and don't utilize it and utilize the, 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 the voices, you are not doing a service to your region, to your city, or to the world, <laughs> because it's where um, it doesn't have to be. Doesn't art is not is is far from about what's happening on the coast, right? Art is about what's happening in the world today. So for me, we 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 focus on the Midwest people working in the Midwest in that project. It's it's a it's a project of about uh, 70, 70 artists and it's a rotating body of work. Um, so we, we don't actually own, we don't own those pictures. We have like this archive where we ask an artist to, uh, who participates, if they would give us sort of working size, because sometimes the prints are so big that people work on now, but we, they, uh, they, they do a working portfolio for us that shows a body of work. Because as a teaching institution or as a collecting institution, sometimes you are only able because of uh, the market and prices and space, you really can only collect one or two photographs by a particular artist. When, as you know, photography, uh, like many, many mediums, but photography is one of the, the most where people do deep projects where they they focus on a body of work where you're going to look at you know I'm I'm thinking about the you know this the, the current you know the current exhibition that we have which is about um, uh, guns and in, in America and we have the work of uh, Nancy Floyd and she has done a deep investigation of women who own guns and so the important part of it is to see the breadth of her work and the all the different people and all the different emotions and all the different reasons of why it's important to these women to own these guns. And if you can only have one picture <laughs> to tell that mm. story, it's not as strong. And so what the Midwest Photographer Project allows us to do is to have about 15 pictures in a box that we can use as a, to teach from to really show the breadth of of, of an artist body of work, uh, which is different than how you can collect. You know, sometimes you can only collect one or two of the pictures because of affordability and all, all sorts of reasons. So as a teaching institution, and also to give people, people can look at the Midwest Photographers Project and you can look at a whole body of somebody's work. And then it's led to collectors wanting to buy it. It's, of course, we use it as a, as a teaching tool. But it's led to, you know, exhibitions, you know, curators looking through what's in the Midwest Photographers Project and curating shows from it at the at the airports here in Chicago or like I know they, they, it, it travels, uh, the work travels or we introduce. So so it's a way to support artists, but to support ideas, but also to support a teaching mission um, where it's really helpful to dive deep into an artist's work to teach from, and that allows us uh, to do that. With my membership in the Charcoal Book Club, I am always pleasantly surprised. Take, for example, the book that is shipping this month, titled Keep an Eye Shut. This is the work of Hanayo Nakajima, who along with becoming a Hangyoku, younger geisha, at 19, also became a photographer. Considered a forerunner of girly photography in Japan during the 90s, her photographs are collected and exhibited the world over. She's had numerous collaborations with photographers, filmmakers, and musicians. 
I have to admit, I knew nothing of her before, but I'm so excited to discover her work in the coming weeks. That is what you get when you become a member of the Charcoal Book Club, the best subscription service for quality photographic books. Become a Charcoal Book member today and enjoy a great new title every month. It's a flexible service, so if you don't like that month's release, you can choose another title of similar value. They offer free shipping to the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. It's subsidized elsewhere. Join the club at charcoalbookclub.com today. And remember, use the code THECANDIDFRAME at checkout and receive a 10% discount on your first membership payment. And if you enjoy the work we're doing here at The Candid Frame, we can always do with your financial support. Each episode requires time, effort, and resources, and your donations help make the show possible. You can contribute $5, $10, $20 or more a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash The Candid Frame. And if you've been thinking about doing this for a long time but never got around to doing it, why not take the time to do it today? It would be a great help. Thank you so much for your continued support. Just by the nature of the, of the work that's done there, you know, you have to plan and schedule the number of exhibitions that you're going to have, what they're going to be on. You have to deal with, you know, restrictions in terms of space, budget, so on and so forth. But t- talk to me about that process. Who's involved? How, you know, how are the sort of the choices made in terms of who's involved in terms of, you know, selecting the work, writing, uh, you know, writing all of the, you know, the additional material that has to complement that? Could if you and if you could use the the American ep- epidemic. Uh, gun exhibit as an example i really would love to hear about what was what's involved in making something like that happen yeah we're we're always kind of brewing ideas um and so we have a team team of us so we're a very we're a very small museum uh we're 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 a team of seven professionals and we're mostly and have um, about 15 students from columbia college that help us run this place uh, they're both uh, undergraduates and graduate students um, that that help us on curatorial levels, on you know, matting and framing and installation and security. And so we're, we're, we're although we're small, we function like a like a big museum in some ways. So I I'm the director of the museum and also serve as a curator. Um, and we have Karen Irvine who curated the American Epidemic Exhibition. She is our uh, deputy director, chief curator. Uh, Then we have an associate curator. um, And we also have a curator of academic programming and the collection. What we do is we meet once a month with the entire staff so that we have, you know, we have marketing, we have development, we have uh, prep, we have, of course, education, we have graduate students, we have a, a very large group of us um, come together, and we are the curatorial committee, and we have proposals that come to us from, we have a faculty board here, and we we work with them, so we're, we're constantly thinking about what, what shows, you know, are complex but accessible. We, 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 we consider ourselves a very accessible place. And when people come in here, we might show really complex conceptual work, but by the time you leave, you will not be like, I have no idea what I just saw. <laughs> you will mm-hmm. be like, wow, well, I just learned about a topic that uh, from a whole new, from a whole new angle. So we have a lot of ideas brewing. And so we'll, we'll take um, Karen's uh, American Epidemic show. That was a, that, this is something that she, she came up with about three years ago, started forming it. Uh, and it was supposed to be a little bit earlier, uh, but COVID, we had to push our whole schedule out. So she had a little bit more time with this show than, than she normally would have because of COVID. And when we do a group show, it often starts by us meeting a an artist or two and we feel that that work is um really important to show 
um, but it might be the beginning of a a larger show. So it's 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 we do do solo shows once in a while, but we typically do group shows where we're talking about a topic from different angles. And so Karen had met uh, Zora Murph um, as well as Andres Gonzalez. Um, from in, in different ways, like we we meet we meet artists from at portfolio reviews, we meet artists by gallery sending us a note saying, "Hey, I'm representing this new artist. I really think you should know about them because I know the work you do and the work they do." So we meet artists, and then and and I would say that for her show, Zora and Andre really became for her the kind of the grounding artist that she then built the show upon. And, and it takes lots of conversations with people. Of, and then it, and it takes narrowing it down because with every topic we do, it's giant. It, it could be, I mean, and you could take it in so many different directions, but it's sort of about, you don't want, you don't want artists completely repeating themselves, you know, like doing this. So you, you branch out. So you have, so, so this show ended up being built upon issues of gun ownership, issues of guns and race, issues of gun and uh, children, and just mostly also the issues of just the amount of deaths that are. And, and it's done by, I think there's, there's 10 different artists in the show that together form a very, you know, complex view where you leave here learning a lot about, or I should say visualizing the data, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, in, in, in a really deep way. And so we typically work uh, about uh, two years out. And sometimes we work longer. Uh, like, like, for example, we do know uh, two projects that we're doing in 24 and 25 because they are really long-term projects with big um large publications and other times we work a little bit faster and the the best part of what we do is because we're small and can work fast it's always amazing people always say to us like you're taught you're i mean like this is in the news now like how are we <laughs> and it's like and but if you think about it like this gun violence show people are like it's so timely and it's like no, this has been an issue for decades. And some of the work in the show was made in 2021, but we also have work from the from 1990 in the show yeah. to really show like, okay, yes, it's timely and we're talking about it, but it's not, but a lot of the issues that we talk about are so deeply ingrained, <laughs> you know, in in our world or our society um, that people think they're timely, but we actually artists have been grappling with this for a long time. You know, considering that, that the subject of gun ownership and, and, and gun legislation is so polarized yeah. in this country, what kind of considerations that you guys have to consider with respect to both people who supported the institution and the audience? Yeah, that is, um, that's a great question. And I would say that um, one of the things that make us who we are is that we, we actually do come out and kind of take a stand. And that can be alienating to people. And I think the art world, we have seen lots of complexity in the art world and institutions taking stands on certain things. Um, You might recall um, the Museum of Modern Art when the travel ban, when Trump put in the travel ban, the Museum of Modern Art changed their permanent collection display to showcase artists who were coming from uh, countries that were, had the the ban Mm -hmm. was put on, right? And so that's, that is very interesting, right? Because for so long, institutions were kind of meant to be the like what the middle ground or you can't take a stand or you can't go on a certain way so i will say we have taken a stand and that could drive predict some donors away from us depending on their views 
but it also draws certain audience and donors as well. That, that said, Karen's approach was very, you know, so if you read the essay that is on, she took the approach of facts and data and the artist visualizing these, the, their, their projects and, and gives the platform to the artist to, to speak their mind. But I, I, I already mentioned like Nancy Floyd's work in this exhibition and Nancy Floyd's work is, is in a way, it's just documenting and, and there's interviews with these women, you know, the women with like why they love their guns and it's pictures of women holding the guns that they own and why they have these guns. And some of them are their grandfathers and some of them are for self-defense and some of them are for, I just grew up with it or, you know, I, they, they, they have all these reasons. And that work in this show is not being critical of these uh, you know, it's not a critical, it's like, you're allowed to have these emotions. So, so we don't come out and, you know, our wall text isn't, isn't saying like, you shouldn't own those guns. It's just putting it out there so that people can understand. And when they read it, you, you, you are very, you, you're sympathetic or not. Yeah. I mean, I'm your way of reaction is to the interviews, you know, but it, it does lay the stuff. So we, kind of take a stand but we also mostly let the the art that we show give that viewpoint although by choosing the artist you know that are showing the work of like the issues of race or like or like so one one of the projects is not photographic and the exhibition is a a quilt with a thousand and four squares and the quilt is made out of police uniform mm. that the artist Carolyn Drake uh, bought from eBay. And the hundred, the thousand and four squares that the quilt is made up of, because it's got a little bit of a missing, represents thousand and four people who were killed by police in 2019. So it's a visual representation. And then what you have is all these different police uniforms that are a little bit shiny, a little polyester -y. some are bluer, some are a little darker, different shades, as she quilts this quilt together. But then the quilt itself, each square represents somebody who's not with us anymore. So the quilt then becomes a memorial to these people. But we're left with, we're showing the quilt. It's made of police uniforms. These people which we don't have, it's just represented by a, a, a black square or a blue square, I should say. They're more blue. It looks black. <laughs> it's darker. Um, so that's an example of we're presenting that work to question how many people have been killed by police in 2019. We have another work by Felix Gonzalez Torres, who, who's no longer with us. Um, and it's similar where it's a stack of posters that you can take and it's a giant posters where it's uh, it was for Time magazine in 1989. I think the piece was done in 1990. And in 1989, he took he took a if he could get a picture of somebody, it's this whole grid of a post of a, this giant poster that has the picture of every single person in the month of May of 1989 that died from a gun. Mm. So that includes murders, it includes suicide, it includes accidents. And as best he could, you know, he has a little bio and if he could get the picture or it's a silhouette and it's this grid of, and it's one month. And I can't remember, I, have to, I don't have it in front of me. I don't know the number, but it's one month in the United States in May of 1989. Mm. It's we're put the artists are just putting those facts out there. And then the way Karen wrote the essay was to lay out those facts and to talk about those issues, but not to then she herself isn't coming out and being like anti gun or whatever, yeah. you know, but 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 based on it you come out of there thinking we do need some better gun like leg 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 legislation. I can't say the word today. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so that's kind of how we take a topic 
and have artist take it apart and then bring it back to you in a very visual way yeah. that hits you. I mean, those two pieces, Felix, the, the two grids, one being a quilt and one being a poster with pictures or silhouettes and names and as much information as he could get on them. That's so powerful. Yeah. And one was made in 1990 and one was made in 2020 in 2021. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And, and and yet they're they're so similar mm -hmm. because they, they're the squares, the grids represent each other, and and that's yes. So and I, I know we went on a long tangent, but it's it's how we present work, and we really are here for a platform for artists, but obviously curators and institutions we're also humans, and we're and it's and, and there's there's lots of choice. You can you can choose to show that quilt or not, right? And so it changes, what, you yeah. know, whatever you choose. So of course, it's hard to be a curator and not. Um, but you 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 put your biases come, your biases happen in in shows, and and you have to be careful about it. But it's impossible to avoid, mm -hmm. and this is why it's so important that you have a diverse curatorial team. And you bring in guests, you know, you invite guest curators and all sorts of different voices so that it's not just one voice curating all of our shows. You know, it's a lot of different voices um, that come in and we let those curators give their voice to their show. And and sometimes like we had a wonderful show by the by the writer and photographer Teju Cole where he went through our collection and and the very you know curated a very powerful exhibition kind of about the state of America through his it was almost like a visual poem he wrote through our collection oh and that's it's neat a beautiful piece and it's a beautiful book it was a beautiful publication and a beautiful installation and heavy heavy it was heavy yeah. but very poetic with the way it was curated and the installation and it built up from single images of the road where you have Dorothea Lang to pictures of war and explosions and deaths and environmental catastrophe. <laughs> anyway, so it was really amazing curatorially of how he went through and how his voice as a writer and a critic, how then he was able to put that onto the walls and we love we love giving our space, like to have it be a platform for someone else's voice, utilizing all the works in the collection. And that is a beautiful show. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Heavy, heavy show. Yeah. Um, it was called Go Down Moses. Go Down. Oh, that's a great title. Yes. I work at the uh, Huntington Library and Museum uh, here in Southern yeah. California. And one of the things that uh, you know they've been talking about and working on is is in terms of expanding the diversity of the audience that comes to visit uh, especially with respect to the you know the exhibitions and like you noted before and and I look and I looked at your your previous exhibitions that you your you and your team have been very good in creating and providing a, a an outlet for diverse voices to showcase their work but talk to me about you know your efforts to you know diversify the audience of 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 trying to incentivize people who normally might not see themselves as going to a museum to see work especially work that may be reflective of because they don't think that they would see themselves reflected in the work that are on the walls T tell me about the efforts that you that that you guys are are making on on, on that on that aspect yeah, well, that's one of the reasons we do bring in all these diverse voices to, to curate shows, um, and that is to bring in different audiences, to attract different audiences, to give voice to different, you know, people who, um, you know, we, we did a show, I want to say it was in maybe 2014, where we, we invited an independent curator, Chantrell Lewis, uh, from New Orleans, to curate a show called dandelion colon re the, the re rearticulation of the black masculine identity mm. <laughs> and, and it was fabulous and this show was about 
dandies that from the Congo. Oh, from Paris, oh my God! London, yes, from oh, America. Those guys are amazing. Yeah. Amazing, yeah. and we worked with Chantrell. So she had she had organized a a smaller version of this show before uh, that I saw, and I was like, okay, this is so this is so great, and it's very. It's not all conceptual photography like I was describing. It's mm-hmm. also just like portraits of, you know, these, you know, the people in the Congo on Sundays, you know, you know, in their pink suits showing off, you know, and, and trading and it's part of the, you know, part of like the culture of mm-hmm. when you're dressed as a gandhi. And, and that show was among our most, popular exhibitions and part of it was that we used kind of installation like we got really creative with the installation so it wasn't just a bunch of framed pictures like when you walked in there was a 17 foot by 20 foot beautiful dandy looking at you and he was big and beautiful and her whole point of the show was like we are beautiful and we are on the walls and we had so many people come and see that show and so many young black men come and see that show and she got she got she went chantrell ended up being called in to go to you know guest lecture at all these schools in chicago because she was they were like we've never been to a place where we were put on the walls looking good mm. not being like criticized as like for journalism or or, or, yeah. or put out there like that so they were like and it was about style and it was about you got to dress you know and it was about the civil rights and you know it was about how you dress to protest and dress and and the history of dress and and that show ended up we ended up traveling it and it went to new york it went to california it went uh, it went to London. I mean, that show, it, it, it traveled for like five years and we just stopped the tour of it because, uh, <laughs> um, you know, things have to come to an end sometime. And, and, and that was just a fabulous show. And from that, we, yes, we diversified our audience, but, but that, you know, it's, this is, there, you know, I'm not going to pretend that, you know, uh, I'm, I'm white. Um, a lot of our staff are white. We have, one of our curators is black. Uh, she's also our newest curator. Um, and we, so institutionally, we still are, uh, have a ways to go, you know, to become like a truly anti-racist institution and diversifying board and diversifying, you know, who the funders are and diversifying the audience. Audience, you can diversify, uh, but then they don't come back necessarily for the next show because it's not interesting to them, <laughs> you know. And so, and so this is the constant thing of like, well, hopefully they come back to the next show that this is that this yeah. is of interest, and then they and and but and they, you don't you can't expect everyone to come back to everything, you know. And but I think what it is is just staying with it and staying, you know, building that audience, communicating with that audience, keeping that audience, knowing like letting them know that we have another show coming up that might, that they might be interested in because maybe they don't want to see the gun violence show, <laughs> yeah. maybe, you know, but the next show that is opening, um, the people who loved the dandelion show, um, I think are really going to love our next show that's opening. It's called beautiful diaspora. And it's really about beautiful blackness around the world and, and people of color and how people thrive and, in you know like i'm i'm black but live in the philippines or i'm you know so it's about this like global beauty with struggle but with beauty you know and, and it's a really interesting it's gonna be a fabulous exhibition and and so it's just important to get that out there and we did really really well we had a wonderful exhibition that was also like so well attended uh called um in their own form and it was about like Afrofuturism, and it, it came out at the exact same time as Black Panther, coincidentally. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was like, what? 
<laughs> you know, anyways, and so everyone's like, how did you time that? And it's like, you know, we're do we're, we just start doing things that are in the conversation because we are working with the right people, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and so that's why I, I give ourselves a good marks for the exhibitions that we're doing. Uh, but we, we have a ways to go kind of institutionally when it comes to how we're funded, uh, who the board members are, you know, that there is, there are issues of lack of diversity uh, in, in those areas. Are there any specific things that you can talk about that, of how you are trying to change that? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, well, one is, I think it's, you know, a lot, a, a lot of it is, well, well, a huge, a nice thing that's been happening over the years is that, um, we're part of a group across all of Chicago. It's, it's art organizations, you know, it's theaters, museums across and funders with, you know, a lot of the foundations they are all part of this group called Enrich Chicago, where we all come together to try to work together. To, to become a less, you know, to become like better anti-racist <laughs> institutions. And, and we, we meet, you know, monthly. And so what, what, what we do is we don't just create the statements, but you actually create the whole, like, what are you doing next? What are you accountable for? How are you making changes in HR policies? Um, how are you, what is, what are you compensating? So, so some direct changes was, uh, you know, the, for example, the, the, the woman who we have recently hired to be our associate curator was a curatorial fellow before. Um, and, th and that was like a part-time position and that has been switched to a full-time position. And, we also created we so we created two more full time positions. So it's just a it's 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 changing priorities yeah. uh, and and having to let go of certain certain things and changing what you think of as what was what was normal, right? And so and, and so we're talking a lot about pay equity, but it's it's tough when you work in like unfortunately the nonprofit world, you know, has always been a little bit like a struggle because. It just doesn't have that deep, deep investment that the for-profit world has. Yeah. You know? and so it's it's harder to change because it's easier to say, yeah, we need pay equity and we need this and we and we why are you know interns uh, our our interns have always been paid internships, um, but a lot of museums um, take advantage of interns, and when you take advantage of interns, you end up with only privileged people who can actually do the internship, exactly. you know, right? yeah. so these kinds of things. So those are where the, the changes are coming at all levels of like, where do you stop the internships only being for people provided who can afford to work for nothing, mm -hmm. you know, and so you, it, it's those sorts of changes that, that we're working with. And so it's HR, it's, um, it's it's programming. It's it's meeting people. It's it's going. You know, it's it's about creating more, most more like cohorts, so that because what happens is like when you have like a predominantly white board, and then you have like a person of color join the board, they're like, okay, I'm like isolated here. So you need you, you obviously need to you need a, you need more of everybody, not just you can't do the token things. Think yeah, that. yeah, because all of a sudden, the, 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 you know. The, they're looking at him or her and saying, okay, uh, how can you help us fix this? Right. Exactly. And, and that is the, that is like the key, key thing is to have them not even almost be part of fixing it, you know, <laughs> like exactly. just saying, that mm -hmm. is not your, your job is not to fix that, you know? Yeah. Anyway, so that's, it's, I think it's, it's what every institution is working on right now. And, and and has been this this isn't just since 2020 i mean these yeah, are yeah. all of these i mean this has been in in the works for a long time i just do think that 2020 just put a lot of put some serious pressure on institutions that were maybe just doing a little bit of lip service too. yeah all the issues of social injustice and just the the dynamics of how things changed just because of the pandemic has you know forced a lot of institutions to really rethink how they're doing things and why they're doing it yeah, but on, on a personal level, I, I'm I would like to hear how you know the last couple of years have made you think about what you're doing 
personally there rather than, you know, seeing yourself as ahead of this and, you know, and looking at it as an institution as a whole, has this time uh, provided you an opportunity to, to explore again, what you hope to, to do in your time there? Are you talking about with like issues of anti-racism or me no, just in general, you know, cause you know, a lot of people sort of had have time for introspective and they go, God, they look at what they're doing, you know, with their work, with their lives. And they think about, Hmm, you know, some people are saying, I don't want to do this anymore. And they just leave, right? you know, or, but other people are just really just reconsidering, okay, what do I want to do with what I'm doing already? Because they may be already very satisfied and very happy with what they're doing, but it's provided them an opportunity to sort of rethink what their goals may be or how they want to do it. And I'm curious to know whether, you know, this time has influenced your own perspective in terms of what you're doing and what you would like to get out of it or, or provide for others. Yeah. Well, let's see. I, I know I have such a hard time kind of separating um, like a, a very personal because I'm so tied to the kind of the mission of this museum that it's hard for me to no. separate it um, for me personally. And, and the reason I say that is, I mean, I, I, this is no like giant announcement or anything, but we're in like a quiet phase, <laughs> which you're not supposed to say, <laughs> quiet phase of like a major capital campaign to really redesign our, the, the museum we're in and rework everything. And so for me on a personal level, it's become even more, I have been like on overdrive, both with enthusiasm in talking to people about what the future of this museum is, uh, because it's for me um, a very exciting time to put this museum on the map and really, you know, what I've done is I, I, I've changed a bit this year and mostly because I'm working on this big capital project, which is a large uh, building project as well, of course, a fundraising campaign. I've had to let go of some of the curating that I do, which is like really both challenging for me because I am a curator and it's what I've done my whole career and it's my passion is to meet with artists and work with artists and cultivate artists and just be part of that conversation. And I will go back to that and write another book and things like that. But right now it's been such an amazing time for me to kind of step away from it and open the door for the others to make their mark. Hmm. Cause I have been here for a long time. And so I'm making a mark because I'm working really hard on this, on, on, on being a director of the museum as yeah. opposed yeah. to necessarily being that curator. And, and that's been so, and so it's fun for me to actually step away from what I have been doing for 20 plus years and open that platform for a whole new generation. And I love what's coming out. It's a little daunting. This is the first year that I don't have shows on the calendar of my, my curatorial shows. <laughs> and, but there's something also really I'm so excited about it and I'm so excited to help lead this museum into that next phase, which hopefully is only a few years away of being a really fabulous space that is here for Chicago, that is here for the, the students that come. That's the, the, that's who we are as the most is like the, this academic museum. And I'm really excited to, um, use this time and have used the last couple of years to be ready for what's coming. And I'm really excited about it. And it's been really great for me to have, have a wonderful team of people who are a different generation than me ready to build this place. Mm -hmm. so I'm excited. Well, my last question that I ask each guest is I ask them to recommend a photographer for our listeners to discover and explore on their own, and it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? So one of my most favorite artists that I have gotten to know um, only in the last couple of years is Martine Gutierrez. And we did a show with her last summer, and she also had a great project um, 
with the Public Art Fund in in New York, where she participated in all these um, bus shelters. You know that like using her her yeah yeah herself in bus shelters in Chicago, in New York, and in Boston. Um, with the anti icon portrait. Um, anyways, I highly recommend looking looking at uh, Martine Gutierrez's work. Well, Natasha, thank you for that recommendation, and thank you so much for your generosity and your time. I, I really enjoyed having the chance to speak with you. Yeah, it was wonderful to meet you through the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to Natasha for joining us. Find out more about her work at the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago by visiting mocp.org. If you're a fan of the work that we do here, you have different ways to support us. You can write a review on whatever service you use to listen to podcasts. Share a favorite episode on your social networks, be it Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Or you can support us financially by contributing via PayPal or Patreon. Thanks to Greg Miller and Jeff Brown for their generous contributions. And if you can't find every episode of the show on whatever service you listen to podcasts, download the Candid Frame app, available for both Apple iOS and Android. And because of your generosity, it's free to download and use. No additional purchases are required. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker. And our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame.